Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Today we're continuing our theme for these two Sundays that focuses on God's plan and how God is trustworthy and how he never fails. This morning, uh, who of you got to watch Time of Grace this morning? Anybody watch it? Oh, you got to look it up on the internet, okay? And watch the Time of Grace. It's on depression. Very interesting. And it ties in with all this because a lot of times what we believe is lies, okay? And we get so stuck in lies that our mind is feeding us that we forget the truth. The truth that God never fails. He always blesses. He always protects. He always cares for us. It's hard for our minds to, to grasp at times and sometimes it'll um, overwhelm us. But this, again, reminds us of our theme for last week and this week. God has a plan, and God never fails. Our order of service is projected for you on the screens, or if you've got the large prints, you have uh, that in front of you, too. And we'll begin by singing our opening hymn, My Soul in Stillness Waits. <laughs> Please rise. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ has risen. 
Christ will come again in his great mercy. God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear, hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. Oh God, you have prepared joys beyond understanding for those who love you. Pour into our hearts such love for you, that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We turn to God's Word for this sixth Sunday after Pentecost. And our first lesson takes us to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 8 through 14. This is one of Paul's so called funeral epistles, penned by the apostle when he knew that he would shortly seal his apostolate and die as a martyr. But death, even, as a, even a martyr's death, is not a disappointment to Paul. Not evidence that Christ had abandoned him. Quite the contrary. It is in death that the gospel shines for him most beautifully. For death is the ultimate triumph of those whom God has made his children. Listen to the Apostle Paul as he speaks to his young pastor Timothy as he's teaching him and urging him to share this victory, the victory that Christ won for each of us, and don't ever stop preaching that, even in the face of death. Listen. 
So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This is our first lesson. Our psalm for the day is Psalm 30. We read that responsibly. Sing to the Lord, you saints of His. For His anger lasts only a moment. Weeping may remain for a night. To you, O Lord, I called. Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. You turn my wailing into dancing. For time's sake today, we're skipping the children's sermon. The verse of the day, Alleluia. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Alleluia. for the gospel. Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 24a and 35 to 43. We read, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Do not be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a, a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha ka'um, which means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and get, began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And he told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Our sermon hymn, Your Hand, O Lord, in Days of Old.
mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. And peace. Peace is what we're really talking about in our hearts and in our minds last week and this week. I think all of you can remember a time when there's been a power failure. I think I've only experienced that once down here since I've been here seven years. I think there was way too many air conditioners going on and it shut everything down. But it happens a lot more in the Midwest where I'm from and storm goes through, the power lines get knocked down and you're stuck. No lights in the house. If you're living out in the country, your toilets won't even work because you're on a well. And you're at the, the mercy of the power company to turn the power back on. And I know some of you are thinking, well, I'm off the grid. I've got the, the, uh, that special battery on the side of my house, so I don't have to worry about it. Well, not everybody's got that. And sometimes it can be kind of disconcerting, especially if it's at night. Well, let me ask you, is there any such thing as a God failure? Sometimes there are signs that seem to indicate that we're experiencing a God failure. A physical problem. A financial problem. A personal problem. A natural disaster. A national disaster. Something bad happens and, and it looks like we're experiencing a God failure, and our mind starts working overtime and telling you lies. God has stopped working. Maybe he has totally forgotten about me. Maybe he stopped caring, stopped protecting, stopped blessing. But it's all a lie. Today, we're going to see that there's no such thing as a God failure. God never stops working. He never stops blessing. He never stops caring. He never stops protecting. Even during those times, it seems as though that God has failed. Our theme for today, God never fails. And our sermon text is Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 33. It's printed for you in the bulletin. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he's young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to one who would strike him, and let him be filled with disgrace. For no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. This is our sermon text. The book of Lamentations is a good one to read when you're thinking about or thinking on this subject. It's written by the prophet Jeremiah, and it's called Lamentations because it's taken from the word lament, which means cry. Jeremiah was crying. He was lamenting because his country had been destroyed by a foreign nation. They had experienced their own 911 situation. But for Israel, it was much worse. Most of the people of Israel were either dead or had been taken prisoner. And now 
Jeremiah was one of those prisoners that was being carried off. It looked like Israel was experiencing a God failure. They were supposed to be the chosen people of God, the nation from which the Messiah was going to come. But now, that nation was all but gone. How could anyone possibly say it could be worse? How could anyone find a bright spot to ponder on even for a moment? Yeah, Jeremiah is one of those guys, you know, who's always positive, that you just want to smack sometimes because he's just, you know, no matter what's being faced, he's going to see the bright side. And this is Jeremiah, God's prophet. Yes, he was depressed, down in the dumps. He found himself being deported to a foreign nation that he did not want to go where even the people he would be sent to serve would mock and ridicule him. But we also see that even though he was down in the dumps, Jeremiah did not despair. We see here in the book of Lamentations that Jeremiah was filled with hope. Listen to verse 22. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. As Jeremiah sat in that wagon, being carted off to another country, he looked over his shoulder to see the ruins of Jerusalem and the smoke rising in the night sky. And Jeremiah was filled with hope. You see, Jeremiah knew that God's compassions never failed. God is faithful. Terrible things happen in life. But God's in control. And he will use them for something good. In this circumstance, God was disciplining his people, Israel. They had walked away from him. Most, most if not almost all of them, had walked away from him and stopped worshiping him. Hardly, hardly anyone believed in the true God anymore. Hardly anyone was looking forward to the Messiah. And God had to do something. So he allowed a foreign nation to swoop in and destroy his chosen people. But not all of them. He kept a remnant. A few of them remained. And that gave Jeremiah hope. Jeremiah knew that because of his, God's great love and mercy, his compassion, that they weren't all consumed. That he didn't just wipe them totally out. That he was finally, in the end, going to bring them back. That he would follow through with his promises to send the Messiah that they had so long waited for. He wasn't going to fail them. Many of the survivors of Israel would repent of their sins and they would turn back to God. And that's why Jeremiah wrote in verse 27, It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he's young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Sometimes we're going to have to bear these in our life. And when you experience these problems in your life, remember, it's not any result of bad luck. There's no such thing as bad luck. God regulates the good things and the bad things that come into your life. And sometimes God allows a problem to interrupt your seemingly peaceful day. When that happens, it doesn't mean that God has failed. It means God has a plan. 
Sometimes his plans are beyond our understanding. Sometimes God's plan is to discipline us, as we see here with the people of Israel. Sometimes we don't know what God's plans are until much later in life. When we look back and we see, ah, that's why I went through that for this very moment that I'm going through now. So as a country, we might ask at times, why is our economy in bad shape? Well, what, what lesson could a nation or world su supposed to learn from that? Our church body and even our own church experiences financial difficulties. What are we to learn? In our families, we're faced with heartache, job losses, serious illnesses, death, financial problems. Why? In the book of Lamentations, we learn that God is in control of everything in this world. And sometimes he shields us from these problems, and sometimes he doesn't. Either way, his compassions will never fail. They are new every morning. I mean, if they weren't, you wouldn't be here right now. If they weren't, your select comfort bed would be flat this morning, okay? You wouldn't be able to get out of bed. Your eyes actually opened and he gave you, he gave you another day to live. God is faithful to you. Look at verse 31. He says, For no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. Did you hear that? Men are not cast off by the Lord forever. That's ultimately what happened to Israel. Remember how long that they were in captivity? Seventy years, right? He had prophesied it many years before it even happened. Many years later, the survivors, they returned to Israel and rebuilt the city. And eventually, the Messiah was born right there in Bethlehem, just as God had promised. God never fails. Ever. But then the Messiah did come. Jesus Christ. He lived that perfect life. He shared the gospel of salvation. And they hung him on a cross. Nailed him right up there. And it looked as if God had failed. It looked as though God had stopped blessing. God had stopped caring. God had stopped protecting. It looked as if God was not going to keep his promises after all. But God never fails. On Easter Sunday morning, you know well that Jesus rose from the dead. That gruesomeness of the cross was God's mysterious way of taking away our sins. That was God's way of cleansing your soul and making it possible for you and your loved ones to be forgiven. To give you the hope of eternal life. God had not failed. If God can take care of your most serious problem, sin, then he can take care of everything else in your life. I pray that these passages from this book of the Bible will fill you with an attitude of patient hope. You see that attitude in verse 24, where it says, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. 
I have waited for things that just have never come. I'm a Lions fan, okay? <laughs> Super Bowl. It seems to always be beyond the grass. I'm sure you've had to wait for things. Maybe, maybe you've waited for that person you've invited to church and they just never seem to come. Maybe you've waited for a card or a letter to come in the mail that doesn't show up. Maybe like me, you just wait for peace. Just a calm, tranquil life, just, just, just for a week, where there's no emergencies and no stresses or no issues. Maybe you're waiting for illness to be cured, but it's not. Maybe you are experiencing anxiety or depression or have a family member that is too. You know, Pastor Novotny this morning in Time of Grace actually said in his sermon, you know, when you come to church, do you think your pastor really cares about all the garbage that you have going on in your mind? Does that strike you as harsh? Well, in a way, we don't. You know why? Because they're lies. They're lies that you're believing. That you're stuck in your depression with because you're believing the lies. You know what we care about? It's the truth. God will never fail you. Ever. Ever. And he sends people, your church, his own son to you to love you. To tell you He's not failing you. You see, God never fails. He always blesses. He always cares. He always protects. He has a plan. And when we're under these adverse con uh, conditions, and don't, don't we at times, when we're faced with these, lose heart? He says, instead, just wait patiently. Have hope. You see, Christianity is a religion of hoping and waiting. In the Old Testament, they waited thousands of years for the Messiah to come, and finally, he came. In the New Testament, the disciples waited for Jesus to help them understand the kingdom of God, and finally, on Pentecost, they understood. The Apostle Paul endured many problems, many afflictions as he shared the Word of God with people around the world of his time. Through it all, he waited patiently for God to work in an amazing way. And God has. I love to see the look on the Apostle Paul's face as he's seen as he would see Christianity go throughout the whole world. And it came even to hear that we're training pastors and teachers to share that blessed message. Thousands upon thousands of them sharing that message. They waited for God to bless them, and God has. Today, all those who have gone before us, their souls are in heaven, and they are spiritually rich beyond their wildest dreams. Christianity is a religion of hoping and waiting. And today that's what we're doing. And we do it with confidence. Confidence that God never fails. He will always fulfill His promises. He's always in control. He always cares. He will never fail you. Because his compassion is new every morning.
for you? Great is his faithfulness. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise. We will confess our faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed. We do that responsibly. The world claims everything evolved by accident, but what do Christians believe? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. The world claims Jesus was only a noble and novel man, but what do Christians believe? We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. The world claims all people have an inborn godly spirit. What do Christians believe? We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life for the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll sing our song of the season. gather our gifts of love to our Lord. If you could please fill out the little white card in the seat back and stick it in the offering plate if you could.
rise. Father, we praise your almighty name. You have blessed our nation with immense wealth and opportunity. Lord, you have commanded us to honor you with our wealth, and I pray that you will be honored greatly this day as we give you what is already yours. Bless these cheerful givers and bless the tithes and offerings they give. We love you. Amen. Almighty God, we acknowledge with thanks that we all have and enjoy, that all, everything that we have and enjoy is a gift from your gracious hand. We come before you today in heartfelt appreciation for our nation and its people. We thank you for enabling us to worship you in freedom and to serve you without fear. You've enriched us with the bounties of farm and factory, the beauties of forest and mountain, the marvels of medicine and science, and for all these blessings we praise and glorify you. Look with favor upon our nation. Preserve our cherished liberties. Enable our leaders to govern with wisdom, honesty, courage, and justice. Protect those who serve in the armed forces and those who maintain peace and safety in our communities. Give us willingness to obey our nation's laws and to work for the common good. Keep our financial institutions secure and our economy strong. Bless our fields that they may produce abundant harvests. Guard us from calamities of nature and accident, and spare our land from the ravages of disease and epidemic. Teach us to worry not at all, but to cast all of our anxieties on you. Strengthen the homes of our nation. By your spirit, lead husbands and wives to love each other, parents to nurture their children, young adults to assume responsibility, and children to show respect. To you, O oh Lord, we bring our thanks and our requests, our prayers for Jesus' sake. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O oh Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who rose from the dead in glorious triumph to bring forgiveness to the world and everlasting life to all who believe. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We praise and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, and we remember the great acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood, and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. We also pray the Lord's Prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated. this true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you in the true faith and through life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given unto death for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which was shed.
please rise. Our hymn of thanksgiving. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now receive with the believing heart the blessing of our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be, well, let's stand for this closing one. God bless our native land. Amen.